Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, you know, it's actually it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Inder Verma here. Um, uh, um, one as the uh, NCBS Infosys uh, lecturer of this of this evening. Uh, Inder spoke here about almost five years ago, um, and is going to tell us uh, something about what he's done. Presumably in that time. A little bit update, and I'm delighted to see many young people. Uh, <laughs> as you get older, of course, I mean, the kids are so young, I think their parents were even born when I had my PhD. <laughs> so I thought what I will do is to start out with a general introduction of the following. So what I would like to, to start out is in 19... 71, when I joined as a grad, as a postdoctoral fellow working on cancer biology, and it started out within a way, Richard Nixon, who said, Signing the Cancer Act of 1971, and I hope that in the years ahead that we may look back on this day and this action as being the most significant action taken during this administration. And that is true, by the way. There's nothing else I can say about Nixon. <laughs> and the reason I mention this is because this is when I started nearly 40 years ago. And the question people always ask is, it's been 40 years, or 45 years, something. What have we really learned for cancer? What have we done for cancer? What dent we have made on the life of people? Have we actually begun to contribute towards some sort of cure for cancer? And now many of you, of course, here very young students, you'll be surprised to know what we didn't know then, what we have learned. The first thing we learned in the last 40 years is that cancer is not a single disease. Now that seems so obvious to all of you, but the fact of the matter is can disease, cancer of pancreas, liver, lung, brain, hematopoietic cells, is each very different. Each is very different sets of genes. And if we lump them together as one gene, which is what it was when I started, you can understand we would have found very hard to do anything with it. In fact, for the public, you still, if you meet somebody, they'll ask you, when will you cure cancer? By that, they, they certainly don't make a distinction, but for us, a big knowledge that we have in the last 40 years is that cancer is a, not one disease, it's multiple different diseases. Cancer is the disease of the genes. Now, this seems so obvious, because all of you grew up with oncogenes, suppressor genes, and you think, well, what is so big about to learn? And the reality is when I started in 1971, reverse transcript was just <coughs> discovered then. And in fact, in 1966, Peyton Rouse, who got a Nobel Prize for the Rouse sarcoma virus, said in his Nobel address, one thing is for certain, genes have nothing to do with cancer. So that, again, is something over the 40 years has now become the mainstay of cancer biology. The third thing, which is a major comp to learn, that cancer is a multi-step process. Cancer is not just one gene, it's actually multiple events coming together, and then they lead together to come to a point where you have carcinomas, which eventually leads to metastasis, which is what usually leads to death of the people. So these are really very important lessons, and as you see in my talk, they have become the central theme on which we have now built what now, as you will see at the end of my talk, has really important contributions towards, if not cure, but certainly um, making the life of people to live longer and making it more or less a chronic disease. So the big part that we now, many of us concentrate is that all of these tumors have a genetic basis to it. And in fact, it's not just like one mutation. I give you some examples. For example, in an average breast cancer, be it be luminal, be basal, there are 30, 40, 50, and sometimes 50 mutations. Or for example, in the ovarian cancer, 50 mutations, gastric cancer, and in some cases had a next 60 mutations. That is to say, these cancers have multiple mutations in them at the level of their genes, and we have to figure it out, what are the drivers, what are the promoters, and what interactions, which happen, what time, what gene we have to study. So it really becomes a major theme at the level of trying to understand the genetic changes, because almost all cancers that we know of have multiple changes in their genetic conformation as accumulated during the, during the period of the time when perhaps the first mutation occurred, nothing happened, 
second activation occurred, nobody noticed it. Only when several of them came together does it begin to become a cell which lost its ability to grow and has become a cancer cell. So 40 years of history has come together now, what we can, I can refer to as the hallmarks of cancer. A typical cancer cell can undergo either a loss of its ability to control growth, that is to say, <coughs> normally cells grow at a certain point and then they stop growing, but the cancer cell has lost that ability and will continuously grow because it doesn't require any signals. Or they have lost their ability to control growth by losing signals which keep the cell not to grow. And it's very often the case that cells grow to a point and then they stop because there are actual genetic changes and codes which say do not grow any further. So you can either let the cell grow uncontrollably by losing signals, or you can actually take away the, the checkpoint signals and the cells will grow. We know inflammation is beginning to become a big part of cancer. So from a moment, a normal cell goes on to become a cancer cell. It could either lose growth signals or it could lose its anti-growth signals. It could be high degree of inflammation. We don't quite know whether it promotes it, stabilizes it, or extends it. And as I said before, most people die of metastasis. We don't really know too much about it, but that's an important component. And most cancer cells have limitless replication potential. That is to say, most cells know 20 generation, 30 generation, their telomeres go and they die. But cancer cells have somehow or the other kept that component alive and therefore they can continuously divide. Cancer cells need a lot of food, otherwise they can't grow. And the food comes through blood supply, so angiogenesis is another component from which you can have the cancer cell get a lot of food. And of course, cancer cells have lost their ability to have what we call programmed cell death. Most of the systems have that, and therefore you reach a certain point, the cells die, but the cancer cells have lost their stability. The reason I show this to you is this 40 years of hundreds and not thousands of people of work have now gelled to actually have a clear molecular road to cancer. We know that if we could intercede here, or intercede here, or intercede here, or here, that we actually have the ability to perhaps slow down the progression of disease. If not necessarily completely cure it, but we can actually intercede with the progression of the disease. And that really is a remarkable thing to think about, that we have actually the roadmap of this terrible disease, which has hundreds of different genes in all kinds of different tumors, but now are emerging some common principles. So how did we reach those common principles? And they were reached by using many of the genes that we have discovered, or many of the mechanisms we have discovered, replicating or duplicating them in an animal model system. So one of the reasons why bacteriology has been so successful is in Cox principle that you can take a, a infectious agent, you can put it into another living organism and recreate the disease. And we were trying to do the same, that can we take these genes from a certain cancer cell, put it back into a mouse or another rodent, and recreate the disease, because then we can say this is the component who has at least the ability to cause the disease from the, the one from which a cancer originated from that particular gene. So mouse has been an enormously beneficial organism for us in terms of trying to prove A, they're a reasonable facsimile of copying the genes, they're very good to additionally identify extra genes. They've been very helpful in, in understanding the pathogenesis of the disease because you can intercede with the progression of disease because this is an animal model system you can control. And they have been very good with preclinical trials. So they have been very good model systems. But despite that fact, they have failed us quite a lot when it comes to treatment. It is not unusual that a mouse model for a certain disease, like a breast cancer, can be cured with wide variety of drugs, but when you go to the human, it completely fails. So mouse has been very helpful, but it hasn't turned out to be such a good model in the long run, and the question is why has it not been such a good model for certain reasons? And here is actually our good friend Bob Weinberg who says, a fundamental problem which remains to be solved in the whole cancer research effort is that the preclinical models of human cancer in large part stink. And this published in Forbes magazine, which is even more important than your normal cell science and nature. And I think Bob is not completely facetious. And the reason for that is the following. 
how do we make our mouse models? Well, in the good old days, we had mutagenesis. That nobody really does it. But a large number of people use xeno and allografts, meaning you can take from a human tumor, either a chunk of the tumor or 100,000, 200,000 cells, put them in a mouse, which is usually a nude mouse, meaning it has no immune system, because otherwise it will be rejected. Tumors grow, and then, of course, you can treat them. But remember, I said tumors don't start with 100,000 cells. Tumors initiate with one cell undergoing imitation, perhaps second cell, third, third gene, fourth gene, and in an immune competent system. The reason only one in four in this audience will have cancer about in their lifetime is because the normal defenses in the body who take care of the fact that if a cell gets mutated, get rid of it. And in fact, we know very well from the experiments of Henry Harris that if you take a normal cell, fuse it with a cancer cell, the normal always wins. And maybe that's one reason we have strong genetic defenses. And yet we are doing a system where we take 100,000 cells, put them into a nude mouse, which is immune deficient, make a tumor, and hope that this will be the good facsimile of a human tumor. They have done well, but they are not the right way to do it. The other way we may now make our, mutant, uh, our uh, mouse model is use transgenic or conditional, meaning you take an oncogene like RAS, you turn it on in a liver, lung, or brain, but every cell in that tissue is now an oncogene turned on. There is no normal cell left in that tissue. It's all oncogenic cells. Cancers don't start where every cell in that organ is, on, is a cancer. They start with few cells. Knockout, P53, RB, every cell is now knocked out. So despite the fact we have a good usage of the mouse system, they haven't been really perfect because all this is the, not the way human tumors initiate. So we argued that perhaps what we would like to do is to create a mouse model system <coughs> where we can introduce a single gene in a single cell in an immune competent mouse and now perhaps add the second, third, or fourth mutation and ask the question, do they make tumors? Are these tumors the exact facsimile of the human tumors? Do they have the right molecular signatures of the human tumors? Or in other words, does it recapitulate the physiology, the pathology, and molecular signatures of the human tumor, because this is more like what the human tumors initiate rather than the one we have been making. So that's how we started out, and let me tell you where we are and what we have learned from that. And the system we chose is glioblastomas. The reason we chose glioblastoma are numbers. First and foremost for us was, as some of you know, half of my lab works on gene therapy, and a lot of the stuff we did is for Alzheimer's and Parkinson. So we knew exactly how to introduce genes stereotactically into the brain. The second thing is glioblastomas are a terrible disease. Despite the fact of enormous amount of effort, the average life from the time it is detected till patient pass away is about 14 months. Ed Kennedy, who died of glioblastoma a few years ago, got the best treatment in the world and lived up to be 14 months instead of 14.1, which most of the people will for the So it's, it really, there is nothing that we know of this disease, how to treat it. Finally, large number of cancers, humans die because of metastasis. You have a breast cancer, but metastasis goes to liver and other places. Whereas in brain, there really is no metastasis. There's invasiveness, but no metastasis. So we didn't have to worry about that, and therefore we chose to work on the brain cancers. As an example, and of course we have not tended it to the others, I'll be happy to tell you that in question time. So Eric Lander's lab, which, who was here not so long ago, they had sequenced about 56 human glioblastomas to ask the question, what genes have undergone change in variety of different glioblastomas? And they can be put together in three general areas. There are a set of genes who are involved in what we call RASPI3 kinase, meaning genes which are needed for the cells to divide. Then there are genes which are also involved in P53 pathway, which means they introduce genomic instability because cancers are highly unstable at the genetic level, or they have a mutation in the RB senescence pathway. So in fact, 75% of all mutations in glioblastomas constitute mutations in the PI3 kinase or this pathway or this pathway. So we argued that if we now want to recreate a mouse model system of human glioblastomas, we will take a gene either from here or from here or a combination of them and ask the question, do we recapitulate the disease as we see in the case of humans? 
So the gene which took was RAS gene, which is a, a, a surrogate for all the PI3 kinase pathway, or P10 in acti activation, which is also involved in that pathway, or a mutation in NF1, which is also in this pathway, or a mutation in P53, which is involved in genomic instability. So those are the combinations we start thinking about. The work that I'm going to describe you is work of three postdoctoral fellows. It was started by Tomo many years ago, who's now gone back to Japan. He's a neurosurgeon. Dino Marvinsky, she's a postdoctoral fellow from the Weizmann Institute. She's gone now, uh, essentially gone back to Israel. And uh, Yashushi is just about finishing. So this is the work of these three postdoctoral fellows. And here is what we did. Of course, one does what one knows best, and we know best the, the viral vectors. So this is how we started to think about making these models. We argued that we will make a lentiviral vector where the gene of interest, and it could be the RAS gene, for example, is floxed, meaning it is unable to be expressed until a molecule like Cre, a recombinase, is given to it. In the absence of that, there the red gene is turned on. This gene is shut off. But we always have GFP, which is a green fluorescent protein as a marker, because that is made from internal ribosome entry site. So when such a vector is put into a cell, which will get the Cre, now the gene of interest is turned on. The gene is flocks now. And you can see the Cre is here. The RAS is turned on only, in the, uh, only when there is a Cre recombinase present. So it's a very tight system. Whenever there is a Cre recombinase, it will remove the red gene and turn on this gene. So how good is this system? Here's the actual experiment. Here is a direct injection into the brain. So brain has different parts of it. In this case, we go hippocampus, which is, again, easy to manipulate and has lots of actively dividing cells. Here is the expression of the GFP and the expression of the RFP. Not surprising, because that's what you get. Red gene expressed, green gene expressed, but no expression of the gene of interest, because they are not flocks. But if you now do the same experiment, but now go into the brain of a mouse, where the glial cells are making Cre. In other words, you have a cell which is now making Cre, and if you put the same vector in that, now the red gene is gone. Remember, that's going to be floxed. The green gene is on, and now the gene of interest is turned on, only when the Cre is present. And you can see there's nothing when the Cre is not there. So it's a very tight system. We know exactly the cell in which the Cre is made is where the oncogene is going to be expressed. And now, could this be a system we can use where we can selectively go into a single cell to put the gene in so that tumor will start from that cell because that's the only cell which contains the oncogene. The rest of the brain is perfectly normal. So that was the experiment we started doing. So here's a direct experiment. We directly introduce the gene either in the hippocampus or the left ventricular zone or the subventricular zone or the cortex. And because every cell where the gene went in will be green in color, we can actually count the number of cells where the gene went in. And those are the places where the, the, the oncogenes should get an expression. Now, we didn't succeed getting one cell. Brain has billions of cells. It's really hard to, to do that. But what you can see is as few as 5 to 10 cells were there. Nothing like the, the way we, everybody else does where all the tissue is making. Here, only 5 or 10 or 20 cells are the one where the gene is being expressed. In fact, we have gone down to up to five cells. And the way we do that is because we can count the number of cells. Do they make tumors? Unfortunately for us, they made tumors. The head become very big. And you can see these are giant tumors. And all the tumors are positive for green GFP because every cell which has the oncogene turned on is also GFP positive, so we can always mark it. So first thing is we were able to make the tumors. These tumors have many characteristics associated with glioblastomas, and they are high cellular density because they grow very rapidly. They have pseudopalisading, a very unusual way that the cells are like, a, like a, almost like fences. These are the hallmarks of it. And they have highly necrotic, and they have a lot of perivascular infiltration. And one of the amazing things of glioblastomas is that they don't metastasize, but they become invasive. You start on one side of the brain, they can go on the other side because they invade all over the place. So the question was, are they invasive? You can already begin to see cells are moving away. And in fact, if you introduce the gene on one side of the brain, the cells now begin to go on the other side. 
And if you reconstruct the whole thing, you can see we made the tumor here, and eventually the tumors have gone on to the other side. So we recapitulated a very important component of glioblastoma, and that is the invasiveness, because we can show from one side the tumor can go on to the other side. These tumors have most of the properties of glioblastoma, but they were not nuclear pleomorphic, and they did not have high metallic activity. These are essential components of GBM, which we were lacking. Now remember, all these tumors were made with RAS or AKT, but it's essential that they also have genomic instability or senescence to create a full model system. So we did exactly the same experiment, except now we also crossed with a mouse, which is P50C heterozygote, meaning the cell which makes the CRE will also make the oncogene and also will knock out P53, therefore creating a condition of genomic instability in addition to the progression of the cell growth. When we did that, sorry, then we get all the features associated with glioblastoma. And that's just technical, because postdoctoral fellows don't want to wait for six months from becoming homozygous to heterozygous, so Dino decided to simply make an SIRNA to P53 and essentially create the same model system. So now we have a model of uh, glioblastoma with all the activities of high cellular density, hemorrhage activity, perivascular, pseudoparasitic, and you can see all of them, regardless of the fact whether they introduce a cross them with P53 heterozygote or directly SIRNA, we make the tumors. So we were able to generate tumors by introducing genes in very few cells. Ideally, it would have been one. We could not succeed, but as few as five to 10 cells, and we re recapitulate the formation of a human glioblastomas. This is actually just a cute slide. I put it for actually uh, for G2 because he's into all these biophotonic gadgetries, right? So, so we have uh, um, um, a, a scientist, Axel Nimmerhan. He has a microscope which he has made, which he implants in the brain, and it actually takes pictures, and the mouse is per perfectly moving around. So here we started a tumor, and we every day see the tumor grow, because all you see, because it's continuously capturing. So here it is, the tumor starts, and it's sort of growing every day. I don't know what to do with it, but it looked kind of cute. Does it matter where we put it in the brain? That was in hippocampus. What if we went into the subventricular zone? We also make tumors. This is purely for students. If they're interested in this kind of technology, you can do a lot of things with these vectors. So here, we not only introduce the RAS gene, GFP in the same vector, we can knock out P53, we can also knock out P10 by sRNA. So you can use these vectors for multiple purposes because you can introduce many genes under different controls. So you, in fact, of going through making transgenics and knockouts, it's so much easier to use these vectors. Oh, it's easier because I don't do the work. Somebody else does the work but it's actually much faster if you want to make multiple different genetic components to them. So once we start analyzing the tumors, not surprisingly, they made RAS or AKT. They made the glial cells because we put the gene in the glia. But the first surprise came that the tumors are positive for nestin, which is a marker for stem cells. They are now positive for tujuan, which is a marker for neuronal cells. They're also positive for, for MBP, which is a marker for oligodendrocytes. So keep in mind, we started in glia cells, but the tumors that originated not only have glia, but also the other three components, which is common in the CNS, and that's the neuronal cell, oligodendrocyte, and neuronal stem cells. And you'll see in a moment where I'm going with it. Well, the, the reviewers uh, didn't like many things about our paper. The reviewers are, you know, we are all reviewers, don't like when new things come, they would try, you know, and the burden of proof is on us. When you use an oncogene like RAS, you can't actually control how much you pro produce. And it's very important to have the right balance of oncogenes. If you overproduce that, really this balances the whole issue. So we said, okay, we'll do the very second best. The, there was also 19%, 18% of the patients has a deletion in NF1. NF1 is a gene, neurofibromatosis, which is involved in very much the same pathway as the RAS, but here it's a deletion, so you don't have to worry about overproduction. So we made a vector then where we knocked out both P53 and, and NF1, and we saw the tumors are very similar. They are again glia positive, nestin positive for stem cell, neuronal cell positive, oligodendrocyte positive, 
high degree of replication, and GFP positive. So regardless of the fact whether we had a RAS gene which actively divides or NF1, which is also in the same pathway but much slower, we get the tumors for the eye of a molecular biologist look the same, although for a hardcore pathologist there are some distinct changes. Secondly, with RAS we make the tumors in about three months. This takes almost about seven months, simply because NF1 is a much slower compared to RAS being a more pleiotropic. But the point I wanted to make was that we, the tumors formed by either way have by and large the same physiology as well as same histology as well as the molecular, um, 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 the, the structure, the presence of the uh, neuronal cells and other cells that are present in the stem cell and that are present in the tumor. Now, there's always been a question, what's the origin of glioblastomas? The reality is we don't really know that because when the patient comes to the doctor, the tumor may have started 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and no one knows where the tumor originated. It might have originated in the hematopoietic cell for all I know. But the question is, can glioblastomas originate in different parts of the brain in different cell types? In other words, the origin may not be important, but that a cell which contain a different oncogene may be more important in deciding what tumors you get. So we then took neurons. So no one has ever actually shown before that can neurons be also transduced and transformed and make tumors. So we did the same experiment. Instead of taking GFAP Cree, we took here synaptin Cree, which is a marker for, for, for neuronal cells. And again, we get tumors which are very similar to what we have seen before. Or we can even take CAM kinase uh, Cree, which is a more mature cortical neurons, and we get the same tumor. That does not mean that glioblastomas originate in neurons. That does not mean they originate in glial cell. I'm simply saying that these cells, when insulted with an oncogene, have the ability to be transduced to form a glioma, which has the features of a human glioblastoma. So it's the oncogene insult that's perhaps more important than actually origin of the cell. These cells, once again, had positive for glial cell, and they're positive for all the SOX2 nestin, which is a marker for stem cell. So remember, now the tumors, even though we started them in a terminally differentiated cell like glia or neuron, the tumors that come out of it not only contain those cells, but also cells which show now the markers for stem cells. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. So I think I may have convinced some of you that the physiology and pathology look very similar of the human tumor to the mouse. But what about molecular signatures? These days, many of the human tumors have been sequenced, and their RNA-seq has been done. And one should ask the question, do the human tumors that exist have any similarity at the molecular level with that of the mouse tumor that we made? Do they have the same set of genes? Do they have the same mutations? So the human TCGA, the, 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 uh, the tumor cell atlas, shows that there are four types of glioblastomas called proneural, neural, classical, mesenchymal, based upon the signatures of the RNA or of, uh, in those particular tumors. And there's a little effect on the outcome of the disease. For example, proneural will die faster than something else. So we wanted to know the tumors that we made with the genes that have been shown to be present in this case, for example, mesenchymal tumor, which has activation and NF1, does our tumor that we made in the mouse have large degree of similarity to these tumors? We can't have identical because human and mouse are not identical in terms of genome, but largely they are the same. We were relieved to note that the tumors we made, all with the uh, NF1, are mesenchymal in nature. But the tumors that we made, in this case with the nest and Cree, they were actually neural in case, and which is what is known before. So now I can say definitively that the model system that we have created has all the hallmarks of a human GBM by virtue of the fact, A, it has the physiology, pathology, and now even the molecular signatures. The big deal about neuro, um, um, gliomas is that they 100% recur. So if the patient goes to the doctor, the doctor has done surgery here, you can see the tumor is largely removed. But during the treatment, the tumors come right back. In fact, this is the only cancer that we know where you have 100% recurrence going to happen. 
And therefore, one of the interests that I got involved in it is why is it that glioblastomas are one of the few cancers where you can predict recurrence, whereas in the other cases, recurrence happens, but not almost with 100% guarantee. So therefore, we want you to know what was so unique about glioblastoma, then that's the reason why patients all die, because even if the doctor has done a great surgery, the tumor comes back, and in fact, you can see, this time it's on the optical chiasm, so you can't even do surgery. So we want you to know why is this the case, and can we actually phenocopy this, and will there be something that we got to learn, which we could not have learned from other systems other than making this type of a mouse model. So here came the first surprise. As few as 10 cells, so now the tumor that we made, we took 10 cells out of this, or 20 cells, put them back into the mouse, and once again we now make tumors, which have all the hallmarks of the same GBM. That means nearly every cell has the ability to create a new glioblastoma, which now you can understand, even if the surgeon removed 99.999% of the tumor, any cell left behind will have the ability to start the cancer again. So which means this smells like a cancer stem cell, means any cell left behind can make the tumor again. So the definition of a cancer stem cell is cancer cells found within a tumor that has characteristics associated with normal stem cell, A, to continuously divide, so self-reproduce, and second, to divide into all the lineages that are present in that tissue. <coughs> so here they are, they can continuously divide as what we call tumor spheres. That's the way you can keep them going. And they can differentiate to all the lineages. Shown here is a glia, neuronal, I don't have here the oligodendrocyte, but they also go to oligodendrocyte. So clearly, something happened upon the introduction of an oncogene in a terminally differentiated cell, be it be glia, be it be neural, be it be stem cell, they have de-differentiated somehow or the other to become a stem cell from a terminally differentiated cell. Now, if that's true, we should be able to capture this. In other words, I told you that every time we introduce the gene, we make tumors. Can we now actually catch this act of when did a terminally differentiated cell upon oncogenic insult became a stem cell. Because that is really the crux of the matter with GBM, because once they become stem cell, it's all over, because every cell will now make a tumor again. So what we can do then, because we knew we can always make tumors, we decided to introduce the gene where we want to, or start the cancer, and now start cutting the tumors every so few days, and ask the question, when did the gene balance shifted from terminally differentiated to, a, to, a, to a, a stem cell. So shown here, I don't know if everybody can see, or G2, you can testify on behalf of whether I'm telling the facts. Here's the direct injection into the hippocampus, and after about two weeks, we can see about 200 cells. Remember, we start with five to 10 cells, we made 200 cells. And now what we do is to let the tumor grow and make sections every so often, and ask the question, when did the glia cell de-differentiated or reprogrammed to become a stem cell? So here, again, this is for the aficionados. I gotta show you some data so that you know this is not all cooked up here. After two days, we see some GFP positive cells as we should because they're all glia cells. They're positive for GFP and you can see green and red coming together. But they're absolutely negative for everything else. They don't have nestin, they don't have neurons, they don't have oligodendrocytes. After two weeks, you can see they have positive for glia, uh, GFP, because everything makes green cells. They're positive for GFAP, and here is red and green together, yellow, meaning most of these cells are making GFP, meaning the glia cells are actually producing the oncogenic protein, because that's where they are green cells. But as we start cutting them, or you can already see by eight weeks, much less glia cells, and in fact, what we see, after eight weeks, they're now much more nestin positive as compared to they were glia positive, nestin being a marker of stem cell. So right in our front of our eyes, so to speak, they got converted upon oncogenic insult from a terminally differentiated cell into a stem cell, and therefore, why every cell now that is left has the ability to make more tumors and differentiate. And that's why gliomas are so terrible, because they have now become essentially all stem cells. Well, you could argue, and reviewers did, that maybe you introduce the gene directly in a neural stem cell which is dividing, 
and you just didn't know that. No, it's possible. So we did the second best experiment we could do, is to produce the astrocytes in vitro. They are glia positive. They are completely negative for every marker of a stem cell that we could do, but they are positive for all markers for glia. And now you can see they are positive for GFP. We now take these cells now instead of the virus, put them back in the brain, and once again they have glia positive, nestin positive, neuronal positive, so we make the same tumors. So as far as we are concerned, this is as best as we can do. That is truly is a terminal differentiated cell which has gone de-differentiation. So what did we do? We did exactly what Yamanaka did, except he got a Nobel Prize. That's a racial thing. <laughs> Yamanaka took a normal cell, put into mkl 4 ox 4 sox 2 knocked out P53, made an IPS, from which they can actually make a whole mouse. If you take a glial cell in vitro in a petri dish, you make an IPS, you put mkl 4 ox 4 sox 2 you make an IPS, and this IPS can make teratomas when put into the mouse, and eventually will can make a mouse if you do the tetraploidy and so on. What did we do? We took glia, neuronal, and, and neural stem cell, introduced RAS, knocked out NF1, or knocked out P53. These gliomas are now SOX2 positive, NANOC positive, MIC positive. Exactly like an IPS cell, except they're in the brain. They're in a niche where they can only go on to make more of the brain cells, and they do not make the teratomas, in the brain at least. The only difference is that, because here in the Petri dish, you do the same thing, but they can go on to make anything. So if you now take out these tumors from the brain and you inject it into the flanks, IP them, and you actually make teratomas also. So they have actually acquired the properties of all the stem cells have. So this is the best way I can describe you that we have created a system where we can finally understand why gliomas are so terrible because they're basically de-differentiated into, into, a, into a stem cell. Now, one of the things about glioblastoma that's remarkable is they're vascularly very rich. And in fact, you're like me, get most of my knowledge these days from Wikipedia. There is about 14 kilometers of miles, actually, of blood vessels in average brain. And it's not surprising because every time you do anything, think anything, walk anything, you need, you need, the, you need some blood supply. So the obvious thing was, why not block the blood supply? After all, angiogenesis is one of the components supplies food to the tumor, why not block the angiogenesis and thereby you will be able to reduce the tumor or kill the tumor. Here is what happened in the patients. There's a drug called Avastin, which is called Bevcesumab, which prevents angiogenesis because it binds to the VEGF receptor, which is the, the receptor needed to bind to VEGF so that you can actually sculpt the endothelial cells. But unfortunately, it worked transiently, and there was absolutely no effect of, of Austin anymore. In fact, it became resistance. In fact, my, the doctors tell me that the treatment with, with bevcesumab is much worse for the patient. Initially it works because it reduces the edema probably, but eventually what turns out is it becomes non-effective. So why is it that brain, which is so highly vascularized, the tumor which are so rich in blood supply, once treated with the inhibitors, actually stop working? And here came another big surprise, which we would not have known if we didn't create these kind of mouse model systems. Well, normally if you look at cells, I don't know if you can all see it, but again, if you can see it, that you will testify to them, that when we looked into the endothelials, into the tumors, you see the tumors are always green, they are GFP positive. And the endothelial cells here are marked by one villa one factor, so you have green and red, you see they don't come together. The red is different, green is different, meaning the tumor cells have nothing to do with the endothelial cells. They have their own origin. But 30% in this particular experiment of the tumors, the cells were positive for green. The endothelial cells and green and red are together here as yellow. In other words, what is happening is you can catch them in the act that the green cells are becoming red cells, meaning there's a trans differentiation. The tumors are now trans differentiating to becoming endothelial cells. What does that mean? First of all, these trans-differentiated endothelial cells are positive for all the markers of endothelial cells. CD31, again you can see red, green, yellow. CD34, red for tumor, this is endothelial cell, yellow for the markers, and CD144. But the surprise is that these are deficient in VEGF receptor. And remember I mentioned to you, VEGF receptor is the one to which VEGF binds 
to cause endothelial cells, and avastin and everything else works by preventing the formation of VEGF to VEGF receptor, whereas the normal endothelial cell have VEGF receptor, but these transdifferentiated endothelial cells don't have receptor, and therefore avastin will not work on them. And that may be one reason why the treatment worked and then they stopped, because many of the cells got transduced in, uh, trans differentiated to endothelial cells. Does that happen? Well, where are they? The tumor has become very big. The middle of the tumor is hypoxic, so they are usually in the hypoxic domain. In fact, you can see the tumors are big. This is a hypoxic probe. Largely, the tumors are in the hypoxic domain. They're transdifferentiation. Just to prove for the skeptics that this is truly transdifferentiation of a tumor cell into endothelial cells, it's a big deal because you don't often see transdifferentiation. We ruled out all the possibility. It's not due to fusion. It is not due to mimicry. It's not due to, uh, and, it, and, they have, and the blood cells are perfectly functional. Again, it's published, and I'm happy to tell you each experiment or how I came to that conclusion. But you could make one prediction. If we treat the cells, the these tumor cells, with Avastin or, 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 or um, inhibitors of, of blood vessel formation, as we decrease the number of cells which are inhibited by VEGF because there are endothelial cells which are normal, we should increase the amount of the transdifferentiated endothelial cells because they're immune to VEGF receptor inhibitors, right? That'll be the obvious prediction. The answer is here that if we treat the animals with or without, they don't survive because it doesn't really work after a while. But look here. When we started out the treatment of the drug, there were very few transdifferentiated endothelial cells. But as we finished, when the animals died, the number of transdifferentiated cells in, increased enormously. So we know that when you treat them with avastin, while you're killing the normal cells, you are converting a tumor to become transdifferentiated endothelial cells. Now, that's true for a mouse. You would argue, what about human? Well, that's much harder because we don't have markers. So the first thing we did was to take a human tumor, transduce them in vitro with GFP, and did the same experiment that you can see here again when we treat them with pevcesumab, which is a treatment of, with the inhibitors of VEGF. And you can actually see the number have gone down. But if you now look at the number of transdifferentiated cells, they substantially increased when we treated them with, with the drug. Once again, much like the mouse, but except in the case of human. And again, you can see these are VEGF receptor negative. But the real experiment is human tumors, right? That's the way to do it. We take fresh tumor from a, from a sample from a patient and ask the question, do they have transdifferentiated endothelial cell? Because that's what matters, because they have been treated with the drug. Now, that's tough to do, but it turns out 30% of human have their GBM amplification of EGF receptor, sometime up to 30 copies. So just as we use GFP as a marker, we can use an uh, EGF receptor now as a surrogate for that. And shown here are patients. This is a patient. Directly the tumor was received, brought to us, and the brain was sectioned. Here you can see they're positive for endothelial cell. They're positive for EGF receptor. And again, you see red and green. So we are convinced now that the phenomena we have discovered of transdifferentiation upon treatment with inhibition of blood vessels, they go on to become transdifferentiated cells. And just around the time we published, there were two other papers in Nature, one saying 90% of their tumor cells were transdifferentiated, and another had 60%. So we think this is a whole new ball game to think about, because if you want to treat them, you've got to treat not only just the avastin, but you also have to treat them with the, with the transdifferentiated component, and how do we do that? Well, this is again something of interest. Just after we published this, I began to read papers. I saw this paper. Cell fusion independent differentiation of neural stem cells to endothelial cells. And those of you who know the SOC will be amused. The author is Rusty Gage, and Rusty and I share a lab together. Right? But of course, I had no interest in those days when he was writing this. But it does make sense now. Think about what I have said. I have said a terminally differentiated cell Upon oncogenic and cell became a stem cell, and that stem cell has the ability to transdifferentiate to become endothelial cell. And what Rusty's paper says is that normal neural stem cells, which is what we think we converted a, a, different, a terminally differentiated cell to that, 
have the ability to become endothelial cell. In fact, that's what creates a niche. So I felt actually pretty good about it, that our hypothesis that a terminally differentiated cell becomes a stem cell, then goes on to become transdifferentiated endothelial cells is probably correct, because that's also happening in the case of the mouse in the normal circumstances. So all this then, there are other examples now, and this is just listed over here. And again, I can tell you when somebody wants to know. So with all that, what do we do now? We have all this information. We have this information that they can go on to become stem cells. We have this information that they continuously divide. We have this information they can differentiate, and those differentiated cell makes tumor. We also now know that they transdifferentiate. Can we use all this knowledge now, and somehow or the other, to use for therapy? There's absolutely nothing for glioblastomas. We treat them with telozolamide and other, but they all come back. So can we finally begin to use this in some way to the therapy? That's not the primary goal when we start our lab, but that can become a goal as you begin to reach certain uh, point of success in knowing what entities to use to inhibit. So the first thing is, can we prevent them to become stem cells? For example, if we treat them with a gene like BMI, SI on it, then which is essential to, you know, it's a part of the polycomb, it's essential to make stem cell. If you treat the stem cell with BMI, you actually prevent them to become stem cell, they go on to differentiate. So one way to start thinking is inhibitors of stem cell, which could actually block some neurogenesis, but they will certainly not allow the stem cell to proceed, and therefore the tumor will be restrained. We are, not, we are following it in a different way, but that's just I wanted to show you an example, you can do that. But the second one is this transdifferentiation. Can we actually block transdifferentiation? Right? Because if we could block transdifferentiation, then we can combine it with the normal blocking of the angiogenesis, combine it with the transdifferentiation blocking, maybe then we can really kill the tumor because they will have no blood supply at all now. That was the idea. And it turns out that these transdifferentiated cells have also FGF receptors, and there are several drugs available from Bristol Myers and J and J, which kill both angiogenesis as well as transdifferentiated FGF receptors. So we got that drug, and now ask the question, what happens if we put it into the brain of the mice, which is getting tumor, do we now have the ability to kill these tumors? Remember, this drug can kill both normal endothelial cells as well as hopefully transdifferentiated because they have FGF receptor on them, and they kill them. So here, first we make the tubes in vitro. That's just to show that when you put this drug into it, you actually prevent the formation of these tubes which is a tube formation is really like making endothelial cells in vitro. So here's treatment of them, control, they big tumors. Once we treat them with brain nerve, tumors are small. You can actually see the size of the tumor is considerably small. They have less blood supply because there's less endogenesis now. They have far reduced transdifferentiated endothelial cells because FGR receptor doesn't allow the formation of the Tdex. So this looks great, and if you look at the tumor, here is the mouse with gigantic tumors. Here treated with Brivnev, and the tumors are very small. So this is really exciting. And if I was smart, we should have stopped the experiment here. But of course, what good does it to make a tumor small? The, what really matters is whether the, the mouse will now live longer. And now when you look at whether the mouse lives longer, there's absolutely no increase in the life of the mouse, whether they were treated or not treated, even though the tumors were now much smaller. So what happened? Well, what happened is that when we treated them with these drugs, the tumors became small, but they became more invasive. So see here now. Here the tumor completely controlled, and here the tumor is small, but they have now far more invasive. In fact, you see hydrocephalus now. So somehow or the other, treatment of the tumor by which we kill their blood vessels was already known by others to be causing invasiveness. But when we killed the whole thing, they became more invasive. They became smaller because they are less cells, but they're more invasive. In fact, in this case, the invasive cell went into the spinal cord, and the mice actually died of that. So I want a little sympathy here. Hard work. We reached this point, and yet we are unable to save them. So what do we do next? Well, can I have another five minutes or so? Okay. So, we, so we treat them again. This is because they were in hypoxic domain. So we said, what if we stop hypoxia? Once again, we see they, they, they become smaller. And again, 
They might live longer, but not very long. And we now know what happened to them. A gene called CMET was turned on, and that also was so, in, well, let me just short circuit it. What we have found is that every treatment we have given them, the cell becomes more invasive because the genes which are involved in invasiveness are turned on. And we now know what those are. We just now begin to work on them, and they are in this case integrins and actually FAC, uh, focal adhesion plaque kinase, which we start inhibiting it, and we think that will have eventually an effect of survival of the mouse. But let me now come to uh, what I really want to have one more point. By the way, again, this is for G2. What we have done, began also so now it might interest you. There is this new technology called Clarity. Clarity is the one which uh, um, when Dysor decide you can take a whole brain, get rid of the lipids, and you can really see brain practically translucent. So we use the same but little modification with PEC, and you can actually see in the brain, here is the blood vessels, and here are the tumors all around the blood vessels. So we can, for the first time after treatment, now begin to see how the blood vessels are looking. In fact, they're highly tortured. So I'm quite excited that we'll learn a lot. But what really turned out to be most exciting for us, and it will be in interesting to the NF Kappa V aficionados, that the brain tumors have very high levels of NF Kappa B activity. And in fact, if we now look at the tumors and take the surrounding tissue around it, the tumors have all the genes activated of NF Kappa B. Now, those of you who are cognizant of the field will realize that NF kappa B is only induced when there's an external activity, in other words, some inducer. But if they go, if they're constitutionally activated, they become into the nucleus, P65 remains in the nucleus. So this case, we've suddenly found that the brain tumors have all the introduction of, uh, have automatically activation of the NF kappa B. And the question is, what happens? You can see all the NF kappa B genes are turned on. So we argued, what about if we block NF kappa B activity in the brain, and we now know many things about it, doesn't allow the stem cell to proliferate and so on, can we actually affect the outcome of the disease? And I'll short circuit here. And what we did was that in order for activation of NF kappa B, you require this particular complex. And there's a small peptide which prevents the formation of this complex, and we argue that if we use that peptide, it will prevent the formation of NF kappa B activity, and you now should see no NF kappa B inducible gene and we'll ask the question, what happens to the brain tumors? So we got this peptide, linked it to a transducent antennapedia from the sophila, which allows it to get into the cell. And you can see, actually, the, the peptide went into the cell, into the brain. And this is the first time that we or anybody else have seen, for the first time, the extension of life of a mouse with a glioblastoma. So here, we start treating them with the drug. We ran out of the drug. Unfortunately, it's very expensive, but the tumors only reappeared after first time we see from 30 to 70 days. It's astounding. Now we pay 10,000 bucks to buy more of this this uh, peptide, and I don't have the data here, but the animals are surviving much longer if you give them continuously. So we are really excited, and so are the clinicians. They are actually going to take this and, and treat patients with it. So from a mouse model system where we came from making a model much like the human, we think we have reached an, quite an exciting area where we can actually begin to use these things in the last six years that we learned to be able to treat now, in this case, hopefully some outcome for the human. So let me finish by two points. First thing is about the cancer cell, the title plasticity versus hierarchy. Cancer cell has only one thing to do in life, and they just want to grow, right? They have no other interest in, your, in their behalf. All they want to do is grow. So we have this marvelous situation created by Waddington, who had actually come to the following, that differentiation, that there's a stem cell sitting at the top in our lifetime when you start your development, and then they are like balls on the top of a hill, and these cells then go on to become different. They can be muscle, this becomes brain cell, this becomes a liver, and so on and so forth. And you can't imagine a ball going up the mountain, and that's how, and it's good news that our liver doesn't always turn up to be pancreas, that pancreas doesn't go on to become brain, and there is a certain deterministic and stochastic quality to that. But what cancer has done is that upon introduction of genes, this can now go on to reprogram itself, or 
maybe don't that completely, it can actually de-differentiate to a certain point. We don't really know whether you first do this and then come back this. I mean, we can do that, we don't know that as yet. On top of that, a cancer cell can also de-differentiate, a trans-differentiate. So look at the plasticity of this cell. And that's why the cancer is a little bit of a hopeless, because they can become stem cells, they can de-differentiate, they can trans-differentiate, and therefore we have to really use all modalities in order to attack the cancers. So where are we, when I just me finish, where I started out? I said 40 years ago, when I became a postdoctoral fellow to start my lab in 74, now, it, I look at here 1950. Heart disease is now half the number of people die. Much less number of people die of strokes. But look at cancer. By 2002, we had made literally no dent in terms of morbidity and survival. So people argue, well, what happened, guys? Billions of dollars spent on you. And what you have learned is a lot of molecular biology, but where have you done in terms of, so this is 2002. But the last 10, 12 years has completely changed the landscape. All the knowledge that we have gained in the last 40, 50 years of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, several in this room and hopefully many in future too, we now know that in the United States, cancer deaths have fallen by 24%. For the first, this, this will translate into about a million point two people deaths that have been prevented since 1991. In fact, when Susan Sontag got cancer, breast cancer, she wrote, cancer overlaid with a mystification, a triumphant mutation charged with fantasy of inescapable mortality. I think today, in 2015, we can say the mystification is not a black box. The triumphant mutation has been exposed, and there are many treatments of cancer. I haven't even mentioned to you immunotherapy, specific molecular treatments, all the other drugs, there were lack of time, as I can talk to you about. So for the first time now, there is poetry for, for people who have been given the drugs like, for example, um, uh, uh, imatinib. Patients who always died of CML within a few months are now surviving for 10 years. Because now we understood the molecular mechanism. It's the BCR able fusion protein which need to be killed by a specific kinase inhibitor, and that allows the cells not to divide. And therefore, these people are treated. All retinal transect. There are 200 clinical trials with all these kind of different molecules, and there is a substantial influence on the outcome of the disease. I think in the next couple of years, cancer will become a chronic disease. Patient will get radiation, surgery, but then they will get molecular drugs, much like AIDS. Think about Magic Johnson. 23 years ago, he got HIV. He just looks as good now as he was then. But he gets drugs every day. You stop them, and the virus will come back. So same happens to patients with cancer. They are now getting drugs every day, like Imatinib, Teresa, Arisa, and so on, and they have a survival now. So for the first time, there are 15 million cancer survivors in the United States. So in some ways, for someone like me, who at the age of 26 started working in cancer, through the work of hundreds and hundreds of thousand people, have a satisfaction at the end of my career that we actually might have made a difference to the outcome of this terrible disease. So one thing all of you can see, particularly younger people, that we have not only a hobby, what we do, but we can actually have an influence on the outcome of a disease which is then corrected for the rest of the world forever and forever. And that's a rare privilege to be a scientist. And I had that. With that, thanks very much for your attendance. And the work was done at the Fox Institute. And the work was done at the Salk Institute. Yes, I'll be happy to take questions. Ah, there's the one now. For, for all for these you know survivors of 15 million people and and this affordability must also be taken into account as you progress in uh, I am sure and that's something other people are thinking about it but I'm just very happy to know that there are reagents and agents and treatments that can affect the outcome of the life of somebody 
but I'm sure those are equally important. I do not undermine them. Uh, sir, does your work explain heterogeneity in uh, GBMs? Ah. Because most of the cancers which are completely treatable are uh, not heterogeneous. You are absolutely uh, right. So that's, uh, in fact, I'm coming today here after four days of conference. The title was Heterogeneity and Microenvironment. And it's, you're absolutely right. There are two kinds of heterogeneity in GBM. One is in the initial phase, but the greater heterogeneity come after treatment with tamazolamide, which is actually a DNA damaging agent. So we now have started taking our mice. We don't know how to do surgery or brain surgery. We just don't know. But we've been treating with tamazolamide, and we have been now sequencing before and after. So if you, we haven't done all the deep sequencing, but we know already from the CNVs that many of the genes which Eric Lander's lab, I mentioned to you early on, we have the same one in our, in our mice. But I can't tell you exactly heterogeneity after tamazolamide because we're just doing that. But that's an important question. But remember here, after surgery, we are removing all the cells. Even if there's heterogeneity, we are going after the stem cells. If we get rid of the stem cells, the heterogeneity goes with them. Also, why do you think there's so much heterogeneity in these tumors? Why do I think them? Uh, For multiple reasons. First of all, this is simple Darwinian evolution. There are few cells, they evolve, they bring in new pathways to survive. That's the simple one. Second, many of the treatments are really quite lethal to the cells. The drugs that we give on are all DNA damaging. And the DNA damaging will automatically create new mutations. Now, which is very bad for some things, but may be wonderful for immunotherapy because it may create new epitopes, so the immunotherapy will probably be more likely to succeed. Um, a great talk. I, I, I had this question about the plasticity in cancers, what you talked about. So this is the case of GBM. So I was wondering that any solid tumor might have such a condition created, hypoxia and metastases being the common factors. So would you assume that the drugs which you are using or the similar pathways would exist. Can same drug work for multiple solid cancers? Would that be of feasibility in future? So I, I perhaps did not make it obvious in the beginning that I'm talking of only glioblastomas here, where I think is the only disease I know where there's a 100% certainty of recurrence. And therefore, we came up with the idea of a stem cell being dividing. That is not true for other cancers. We do the same experiment for lung cancer. That's not the case at all. And that's not true for pancreatic cancer. So different cancers have going to be different. The treatment that we are proposing is not going to be the same for small cell lung carcinoma as that's for the glioma. Because this plasticity is very different in the gliomas as compared to that of the, of the, uh, um, of the lung cells. Well, could that be because brain is an immunoprivileged site? Would you? I, I, you know, it may be, but I have never found that. Because we work on gene therapy. Every time you use vectors, they're just as highly inflammatory. There's plenty of microglial cells which can do plenty. So I think this whole immune privilege of brain is a very good explanation when you can't explain something, but I don't think that's true. So have anyone looked at uh, the percentage of stem cell population in a, a glioma uh, versus a stem cell population versus other tumors? And have they found in glioma the stem cell, cancer stem cell population is more, like number of cells, or something like that, like because so, you told uh, there could be a lot of cells like neural stem cells, astrocytes, neurons getting transdifferentiated or dedifferentiated into neural stem cell population. Is there a percentage increase? So if you take tumors, which are GFP positive in this case, they are a mixture of stem cell, they're a mixture of, D, of, neurals, of um, neurons, glial cell, but they're all containing an oncogene in them. So all of them, when put back into it, de-differentiate to become stem cells and therefore cause the tumor. So we can, in my estimation, nearly every cell, as few as five and 10 I said, has the ability to cause cancer. So it really doesn't matter whether we have stem cells or differentiated because they all have oncogenes, they go on to de-differentiate to become stem cells. But if we do the same experiment with lung, that's not the case. Because there, it's not due to stem cell, it's only glioblastoma, every cell is a stem cell there. So have anybody looked at a tumor population? Have they done a sort or something and counted the uh, 
to see an enrichment in stem cell population using some markers? Well, we have GFP positive in our hands, right? So we can do GFP selection and then do analysis of them by, by microanalysis. Most of them have the markers of a stem cell because even the thermally differentiated cell they have been de-differentiated. So the markers are pretty much that of the stem cell in all cases. So this case is very different than any other case. What triggers the trans-differentiation in these tumors? So it's a good question, and uh, I sort of rushed through it. We've been asking the question, what's the mechanism you're asking? How does, yes. uh, what triggers is hypoxia? Yes. Right, that we know, because it's only in the hypoxic domain. If you have hip knockout mice, you don't see the, uh, or if you treat them in vitro with the drugs, you don't see that. So we did a, 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 a RNA-seq to see what genes are turned on. And the one slide that I went through it, one of the genes that we recently honing on is semaphorin-3. Semaphorin-3 has a promoter in it which is HIF activated. At least it's not a bat, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, and then I would be worried. <laughs> so that's uh, one of the genes. And if we now take an SIR into semaphorin-3 or plexin D1, which is the, 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 the receptor to which binds, we make no Tdex. So we're just beginning to do that uh, kind of experiments to know what's the precise mechanism. The ones that we used in this example that I showed you is an NF1 P53. And the tumors that are made from NF1 P53 are mesenchymal. Now, we have also used a PDGF and P53, or RB, I forgot which one, they make proneural. And they have also been affected by NF kappa B. What NF kappa B, I think, is doing in this case is not initiating the stem cells, but keeping them maintained as stem cells so they don't need they don't differentiate into other lineages. So that's where NF kappa is functioning. Okay. So the recent literature also suggests that one tumor also, one GBM, can have different components of different subtypes. It may be. It may be. I don't know that because we haven't sequenced. Because remember, we started our tumor with one gene. So it's likely that the outcome of that tumor will be more from that gene. Unlike the human tumor, there may be multiple ones. But as far as we know, that the stem cell ability to maintain themselves is where the NF kappa B is acting. So whether it's a proneural, we haven't done the neural and others, we think the commonality still lies in the stem cell remaining in stem cell, and that's why you knock out the NF kappa B that doesn't occur, and therefore the tumors don't. don't. So there was one paper from Kenan Dabi's lab wherein they are seeing from uh, proneural stem cells, they are seeing the difference between proneural stem cells and Very different results from ours. From, uh, I mean, not, not very different. He just looked at the NF kappa B activity. What I am showing you here that the genes are activated. He never showed that the NF kappa B is actually nuclear in any of those cases. Where in our case, most of them is in P65 is nuclear, and the genes are activated by the NF kappa B. He never used the experiment to show that you block NF kappa B, you can actually block. And what I am saying is that when you block it and therefore you block the development of the tumor. So we are, we are not in disagreement. He says you also make tumors. Now, those of you get really hung up on the idea of proneural, neural, mesenchymal, classical, it's not a clear distinction at all. It's like a rainbow. In fact, you can look at any of the TCGs. It's like, more like a rainbow. It's not a clear line the way, way Verhaag decided it. If you tell him, he gets ticked off, but that's not the case. Yeah. Uh. Uh, well, the question is something about the mechanism uh, by which an oncogenic insult actually induces this kind of trans-differentiation or de-differentiation. How do you explain? Because in the TCJ paper, which was uh, published in 2008, there were three different pathways which are implicated to be uh, involved in this uh, gliomagenesis. So, and when you employed the same, you introduced any kind of genetic insult and uh, you were able to reproduce glioma in mouse model. So any kind of in oncogenic insult re uh, resulting in the formation of this uh, a mechanism of trans differentiation. I Can it don't, be explained? No, no, let's make two things. Are we talking of stem cell formation? Yes. Or are we talking of trans differentiation? 
uh, stem, stem cell formation by. So you're asking the question, if I understand, that oncogenic, any oncogene can do that. Whether you uh, induce uh, deletion of NF1 or activate RAS ah, or. De uh, I don't know. There are 30,000 genes, right? I can't tell you if every gene has worked. But if you look at the, the map that uh, Broad, Broad Institute has, we haven't done every one of them. We have only done the few ones that that's the right. proof of principle, and that's RAS. That's not even the true one because only 2% is really EGF receptor downstream. We have done PDH alpha. NF1 is in the same pathway. We have done P53. And I think that's a sufficient number for us to make a general argument. I can't tell you if I were to use the rest of the 40, we'll get the same result or not. I suspect we will, but we have only used a few. Now, were these chosen just, I mean, or there was some? Oh, yeah. The reason it was, RAS was chosen because the surrogate were downstream, all right? NF1 was chosen, as I explained, because the reviewer wanted to know that RAS is overproduced, you screw up the system. So we said we'll use NF1 in the same pathway, because once you knock out, you can't blame you over screwing the system, because it simply knocked it out. So that's why those were chosen. P53, because it becomes genomic instability. PDGF1, because it has been shown to be present in a uh, neural, uh, pro-neural, so we could change different concepts. And there are other people doing in the lab other things, so we chose those for that particular reason. And something on the NF cover B aspect, uh, will it be better to go a little bit deep and uh, search for some of those targets so as to get rid of the side effects? So, so it, right because now we don't know the side effects because it is clearly pleiotropic. It will have side effects. And we know all the genes. And uh, if you really want to know the ghastly detail, I'll tell you what genes we have. But the TIMP1 is the one which is the most activated. So yeah. right now we are going after TIMP. So that's uh, what, I mean, it might have some tens of targets. It, it is quite possible, but I'm actually astounded at the moment that these mice has really no pleiotropic effect. I would have thought NF kappa B will have it. It'll certainly kill the tumors, I mean, the liver. But we haven't seen anything, I think perhaps because they're directed towards the brain. Maybe because that the it's very highly activated only in the brain uh, part uh, of the No, because the peptide is going in the brain. So we'll see. I mean, you know, it's only about a couple of months if the mouse, what else happens to it. But it's because it's directed to the brain. If we had done an IP of a ML1 or 102 inhibitor, which goes all over the place, I suspect then the mouse will have more toxic effects. Yeah. But if there are no further questions, let's thank Inder for a fabulous talk. <laughs> <laughs>